Hello, and welcome to our educational video series. Cryotherapy has been used safely for decades in the management of respiratory diseases. In this video, we will review the fundamental of thermodynamic and describe the Joule-Thomson effect, and its application in interventional pulmonology. We will also touch base on the cryospray therapy, a new modality in managing airway diseases. To start, let's review the principle of the Joule-Thomson effect. You may wonder, how the equipment you are using can deliver cold and freezes the tissue. In real world, the Joule-Thomson effect is a thermodynamic process, that occurs when a fluid expands from high pressure to low pressure across a valve. Under the right conditions, this can cause cooling of the fluid. If you have a liquid that is condensed at high pressure in one side, and a valve at the other end, when you open the valve, the pressure downstream is lower than the upstream pressure, which is causing flow to happen from left to right. The downstream pressure Px, will always be lower than the initial pressure P1, but the final temperature, Tx, will depend on two countering effects that are taking place. 1. The pressure energy being converted to heat. 2. There is decrease in temperature because of decrease in pressure. Depending on which of the two effects will dominate, we will have either heat, or cooling at the outlet level. Here, we set up a constant high pressure P1, and a constant temperature T1 on the left. Then, using the valve, we will set up a constant value for P2, and measure the temperature T2. While keeping the P1 and T1 the same on the left, we set the valve this time, to obtain a lower pressure value P3, and we measure the temperature T3. The process is repeated by continuing dialing the valve to obtain lower pressure Px on the right, and then measure the temperature Tx. The results will provide a set of points that can be plotted as shown in the next diagram. As you can see, the curve obtained has a positive, and a negative slope, as well as a maximum point. The temperature will drop, but that will depend on where your starting point is. You can either observe a rise in temperature, like here in T2, or a drop in the temperature that is seen with Tx. Now, if we keep P1 constant, but change the initial temperature T1, and repeat the previous process, we will come up with series of curves with positive and negative slopes and maximum points. The line in blue, that connects all maximum points, is called the inversion line. Cooling occurs where the slope of the curve is positive. Heating occurs where the slope of the curve is negative. To have maximum cooling effect, the initial state of the gas should lie on the inversion curve. The inversion temperature represents the temperature of a gas, at which a reduction in pressure causes no temperature change. Please note, the curve seen here, above the maximum inversion temperature, has only a negative slope, and cooling won't be possible. The gas has to be pre-cooled below its maximum inversion temperature before it can be used. Based on what we have learned, we can choose a state point and the initial temperature of a gas to have an immediate and maximum cooling effect. Now that we understand how our equipment produces cold, let's discuss cryotherapy. It is defined as the controlled application of extreme cold used for tissue ablation or devitalization. It is an easy to perform procedure with minimum complications. The mode of application can be by direct contact using a probe or by spraying of a liquid cryogen. Available cooling agents are, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide and liquid nitrogen. Nitrous oxide, it's stored in the liquid state at room temperature in high pressure bottle. Carbon dioxide has undergone technological advanced over the years, and is becoming the cryogen of choice for certain applications. We will discuss liquid nitrogen later during this video. In both modalities, cryoablation or cryodivitalization, there is probe contact and adhesion to the targeted lesion. In cryoablation, freezing time is very short, and is used to recanalize tumors, obtain biopsies, and extract foreign bodies. The tip of the cryoprobe is activated on the target tissue, and once the desired freezing time has elapsed, usually between 3 to 5 seconds, the cryoprobe is withdrawn abruptly together with the bronchoscope and the specimen is collected. You need to maintain visual on the area that is being treated. One of the main advantage on cryobiopsy when compared to forceps biopsy, is the tangential application, especially when the lesion is small. Cryodivitalization, aims to destroy the tissue by the application of extreme cold. Freezing time for up to 3 minutes has been described, it is usually applied for 60 seconds. The size of the collected frozen area, depends on the freezing time, the contact area of the probe, the moisture, the tissue, and foreign body properties. Compared to other ablative modalities, cryotherapy does not require reduction of oxygen and is helpful in patients who are already hypoxic, and needing oxygen supplementation, and may not tolerate oxygen below 40%. Due to the delay effect, the main contraindication to cryotherapy, is severe life-threatening airways obstruction. 
What is transbronchial cryobiopsy? And how is it performed? Compared to the traditional transbronchial forceps biopsy, the transbronchial cryobiopsy is associated with a higher risk of procedural morbidity and mortality. But it has some value in the diagnosis of diffuse pulmonary lung diseases, by providing larger and qualitatively better samples. Usually performed on intubated patient under general anesthesia, and under fluoroscopy guidance. Prophylactic use of Fogarty catheter is also used in the segment where the biopsy is performed. The feared complication using transbronchial cryobiopsies, are pneumothorax and bleeding. Irby manufacturer, has upgraded the cryo unit with few new features, using CO2 as the cryogen. It can now be used, either as a standalone unit, or be mounted along with the electrosurgical consoles, on a single tower. Now, let's review spray cryotherapy. Couple of devices are available commercially for the endoscopic application of cryospray. We will only discuss the true free spray cryotherapy system, which is becoming widely used for endoscopic application of cryospray. It is a non contact modality that delivers liquid nitrogen and is used to treat benign stenosis and airway tumors. Most of the data come from the GI literature in treating Barrett's and esophageal cancer. The published literature on the use of spray cryotherapy in the airways is growing. It delivers extremely cold liquid nitrogen spray, at low pressure through a specialized small catheter. The liquefied liquid nitrogen exits the catheter in a form of spray, at minus 196 degrees Celsius, causing flash freezing. This modality, does not use the Joule-Thompson effect. Spray cryotherapy is usually performed in an intubated and sedated patient. Ventilation is held during the period of spray cryotherapy. Adequate venting of the gas is required due to the rapid expansion of nitrogen, a phase change from liquid to gas. Continued chest expansion is an indication of gas retention, it should prompt immediate abortion of the procedure. The feared complications are pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. If using an endotracheal tube, as opposed to the rigid scope which is an open circuit, the ET tube is detached from the ventilator, and the cuff is deflated to ensure an open circuit. Most applications last 5 seconds, with a minimum of a 30-second waiting period between treatments. Again, when using this modality, the nitrogen needs to be vented, and that can be achieved through passive venting. Monitoring for chest rise during sprays is important and necessary. And inspection and palpation of the chest wall and neck for crepitus, should be performed at the end of the procedure. If using laryngeal mask airways, instead of an endotracheal tube, the abdomen should also be monitored for distension. In summary, cryotherapy is widely used in the field of interventional pulmonology. It is important to understand the concept of Joule-Thompson effect, but it is not always used during cryotherapy. Spray cryotherapy using liquid nitrogen is a new modality to treat airway diseases, and it is important to understand the concept of passive venting, for the safe use of the cryospray. This concludes our video, thank you very much for your attention. For any comment or suggestion, please don't hesitate to leave us a message below. Goodbye.